Hey, welcome back to Mrs. B Reads. We are working on Something Upstairs by Avi, and uh, this is chapter two, page 20. Oh, this book was so good. Kenny made his way back to bed, determined to think through all that had happened. But the next thing he remembers is the morning sun pouring through the skylight, waking him. As soon as he realized it was morning, he jumped up and went to look at the room. All he found was that same small, empty, dirty, and very dull room but the single box of books was pushed off the stain. Gazing at the stain again, Kenny was reminded of his thought when he had first seen it, that it had something to do with a death. There was nothing about the stain itself to put him in mind of a person or death, just a dark blotch. Then what, he wondered, had caused him to think that? Kenny was glad to find his parents had not yet left for work. Any plans for today, his mother asked him. Kenny shook his head, slumped into a chair, swallowed some juice, and poured himself some cereal. Somebody told me about a swimming club, his mother went on. I think you could walk to it. You'd probably meet some other kids, too. Interested? Sure, Kenny said. I'll try to get off a little early, his father said. We could check it out then, or you can do it on your own. Where is it? Kenny asked. His father told him. Kenny had already learned enough of the area to realize it wasn't far. I'll do it myself, he told them. As his mother was about to take off, she gave him a kiss. Sorry this time is such a drag, she said. School will start soon. I'll live, he assured her. Good, she bantered, giving him her brightest smile. I'd hate to see you otherwise. Something about her words stirred him. Ma, he called just as she reached the door. She stopped. Do you, Kenny asked, believe in ghosts? Ghosts, she said, surprised. Right, ghosts. His father looked up quizzically from behind his paper. What makes you ask, she said. Just curious. No, she said, I don't. Do you believe in ghosts? With a wave and a smile, she left. Kenny's father gave a shake to his paper. What made you ask that, he wanted to know. Kenny checked himself. It was hard to tell his father he believed the attic was haunted. A dream I had, he managed about something upstairs. That's where the title of the book comes from, by the way. His father laughed. Hey, everybody has something upstairs. Kenny looked up. What do you mean, he said. You know, his father said offhandedly, something you don't want anyone to know about. Secrets. What about a ghost, Kenny asked cautiously. His father chuckled. If any place has the right to a ghost, he said, it's here. Why? Providence is a really old town. Lots of things must have happened here. Do you believe in ghosts, Kenny asked him. Nope, his father replied and retreated behind the paper. Dad, what? Kenny said, you know that scrapbook we were given? About our house, his father lowered the paper, sure. Well, it has all these names in it. People who lived in this house, right? How could I find out more about them? Such as what? Who they were, what they did for a living, if they had any kids who lived with them, stuff like that. He tried to make it sound of no great consequence. You certainly are caught up in this place, aren't you? I guess, Kenny said sheepishly. Sheepishly. Boy, that's a really hard word to say. <laughs> Glad you have something to occupy yourself, he said. It makes me feel better about this time. What do you mean? I don't know, he said. Sometimes strange things happen to people in strange surroundings, particularly when they don't have much to do. So your project sounds worthwhile. You'll be our resident historian. I suppose a library could help you. He fetched a phone book and flipped through the pages. Boy, that'll tell you how old this book is, right? He fetched a phone book and flipped through the pages. So um, what is the copyright on this book? Oh my gosh. First edition of oh, this edition was printed in 2010. But this book is older than that. Obviously, it came out before everyone had iPhones and Googled everything. I'm going to have to figure out when this book was first published. All right, we're working on that. Stand by. I'll figure that out. Ah, he fetched a phone book and flipped through the pages. Do you guys even know what a phone book is? <laughs> There's one on Ive Street. Where's that? Not far, Kenny said. Walking distance. And in fact, Ive Street is in Providence, Rhode Island. After breakfast, Kenny went up to his room and took out the scrapbook about their house. In it, he studied the names of the people who had lived on their plot of land. Williams family, 1636 to 1743. 
Sheldon, 1743 to 1769. Stillwell, 1769 to 1845. Blaisdell, 1845 to 1849. Lawton, 1849 to 1867. Lake, 1867 to 1890. Vicky, 1890 to 1912. Butter, 1912 to 1929. Myers, 1929 to 1930. Salazar, 1930 to 1947. Flood, 1947 to 1963. And Melton, 1963 to 1987. So this book is set in the late 80s. That's what tells us, okay? And so Kenny's family, the Huldorf family, would be then 1987 to whenever. And yes, back in the late 80s, there weren't cell phones and computers, and there were things like phone books. Their street was named Sheldon. He made a connection there. As for the rest, the names meant nothing to him. He copied out the list and set off. At the Ives Street Branch Library, Kenny quickly located a few books about Providence. For a small place, he discovered, the city has an enormous history. He learned about the person who founded it, Roger Williams, how Providence people argued among themselves with Massachusetts, with Connecticut, as well as with the English king about becoming a colony, how Providence joined with the island of Rhodes to arrive at the official state name, the state of Rhode Island and Providence plantations. Now, it should be noted that just last year in the Rhode Island state legislature, there was a movement to change the name because the word plantations is associated very closely with slavery. And um, I believe that that passed, that the state of Rhode Island changed its name. They shortened it and they got rid of the Anne Providence Plantations part. He learned that the first big American war against Indians ended in a massacre nearby. He read about the burning of the ship Gatsby, a prelude to the revolution the first act of rebellion on American soil was the burning of the Gatsby in Warwick, Rhode Island. It was not the Boston Tea Party. Um, ah, la, 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 la. He read about what happened in Providence during the revolution, how the people of Rhode Island didn't approve of the constitution because it was not democratic enough. He found chapters about famous Providence sailors and merchants, how far they sailed, how they were the first Americans to go to China, this is true, how brave they were, how they grew rich trading rum and molasses. Rhode Island, Providence was a point on the triangular trade if you ever learned about that in history class. And finally, he learned how some of them, full of democratic ideals for themselves, made great sums of money bringing back people from Africa and selling them in the South long after the slave trade was illegal. But Kenny could find nothing about his neighborhood, much less his house. When he explained to the librarian what he was looking for, she said, what you want is the historical library. That's exactly the kind of thing they specialize in. It's only seven blocks from here where the streets called Hope and Power meet. Sure enough, there is a library there on Hope and Power Street. The historical library, one of the old buildings and not exactly cheerful, is a big dark brown block of a place. Kenny had to ring a bell to get in and then he was questioned at the main desk. I need to do some research, Kenny told the librarian. The man pushed forward a notebook and handed Kenny a pen. Just sign in there, will you? Kenny signed. The man looked at the signature. Holdorf, sounds familiar, he murmured and pulled a card from the drawer. Right, just got a message this morning. Someone up at administration is expecting you. Me? 15 Sheldon Street? Kenny nodded. Yep, you'll have to check in the administration office for permission to use the collection. Where's that? Go out into the hallway, turn right, you'll see some steps, go on up. When you get to the top, turn to your left. It'll be the first open door on the right, got that? Puzzled that he should be expected, Kenny walked out into the deserted hall, made a right turn, went up the steps. At the top, he had to stop and think over the directions before making another right turn. There, Kenny found an open door. He walked in. The room he entered was shadowy, except for a lemon-colored blade of sun slashing through a tall coffin-shaped window at the end. The walls were covered with shelves, and the shelves themselves were filled with yellowing papers, boxes, and books. The air was laden with dust. In the middle of the room was an antique desk, and behind the desk, a man in black. 
He was a small, thin man, white-haired. His fingernails were narrow and long with carefully, I'm sorry, his fingers were narrow and long with carefully trimmed nails. At the front of his desk was a brass nameplate. It read, Pardon Willinghast, historian. Now, Pardon might sound like an unusual name, but back in the day, Pardon was a very common name, particularly in the Providence, Rhode Island region, um, because there were many Quakers, and Pardon is a common Quaker name. So this gentleman's name is Pardon Willinghast. Sir, Kenny said finally, he had been standing in front of the man for a few moments without being noticed. The man looked up. His parchment colored face, lined like a map of many roads, seemed rarely to, see, to have seen the light of day. His eyes were both dark and deep. His expression was grim. May I help you, he asked softly. Kenny gave his name. Haldorf, the man said. Ah, yes, he drew himself up. I believe your family has just bought and moved into 15 Sheldon Street. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How come you know, Kenny asked. The old man was silent for a moment. Then he cocked his head slightly to one side. House transfers are listed in the newspaper, he said. I have a desire to keep track of the old ones. It's a way of making myself useful here at the library to new owners who often show up. Satisfied with this explanation, Kenny told Willinghast that he wanted to find out about the people who used to live in his house. I've got a list, he said. Can I find out some stuff? Use the library? May I? Asked Willinghast. See the names you brought? Kenny offered the list. He remembers fiddling with his keychain while the man studied the paper. Willinghast looked up at him at last. Do you have any knowledge about these people, he said. Kenny shook his head. May I suggest that there won't be much about them, Willinghast said. Not if this is all you have. If you will allow me, I'll retain it and check through some of my own resources. Come back tomorrow and I'll tell you what I've been able to find. Is that agreeable? Kenny said yes. Good, said the man. He rose and came out from behind the desk. I'm always here at your service. With a gesture, Willinghast guided Kenny to the door. Question, as a reader, how do you feel about Pardon Willinghast? Do you trust him or not? I'm just wondering. Once more, Kenny stood in his attic, looking at the room, his eyes drawn again and again to the stain. Finally, he knelt by it, touched it. It felt cold. It was then that he had an idea. Using an old Boy Scout knife, he pried up a splinter of the wooden floor from the area of the stain and carefully wrapped it in a tissue. After dumping his allowance savings into his pocket, he took the splinter around the corner to Wickenden Street, where there is a pharmacy. Can I help you? asked a white-coated woman behind the counter. It's sort of weird, Kenny said, suddenly feeling awkward. Give it a try, she said with a smile. Kenny explained who he was, where he lived, that he and his family had just moved in. He said they were fixing the place up and wanted to paint some floors, but one floor had a stain on it. His folks, he said, needed to know what that stain was before painting. Is there any way to check this out? He unrolled the tissue and handed the woman the splinter. The pharmacist held it up, gave it a squint and said, not that unusual a request. We can send it in for chemical analysis. It will cost. How much? Oh, ten dollars. Kenny counted a fistful of coins, just barely enough. The woman asked his name. He gave it to her and asked, how long will it take? I'll call as soon as a report comes in, she replied. Kenny thanked her and left. It was during dinner that Kenny asked his parents, why do ghosts haunt houses? His father turned to his mother. Kenny dreamed about ghosts last night. Oh dear. First of all, his father continued, I don't believe in ghosts as I told you. Secondly, they supposedly haunt places because something awful happened to them there. You know, a person is killed and his ghost remains in the house or something unhappy occurred there. At least I think that's the notion. I've never heard of a happy ghost. Have you, he asked his wife. She shook her head. That must have been a vivid dream, honey, she said. It's living in an old house in an old city, his father put it. Lots of memories here. His mother said, I don't believe in houses having ghosts. And then she added, but you know, I'm willing to admit they have memories. It was a thought that intrigued Kenny. What's the difference, he asked. His mother thought for a moment and then she said, I'm not sure. 
It was then that Kenny, without saying anything to his parents, made up his mind. That night, he would set his alarm for 2.15 and try to see exactly what was happening in that room. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks.